being authentic in documentary filmmaking, I can't tell you how crucial it is, crucial, and to the success of it. As a Moroccan immigrant in Israel, we, we really did not have a voice. Not only we didn't have a voice, but our voice was considered inferior, and so they were shutting us down. That was the only way I knew how I can be fulfilled by telling stories that matter, stories that have an emotional impact. This is a conversation with filmmaker Michelle Ohayan. Michelle is a Moroccan director from Israel who broke through with her documentary, Color Straight Up, which was nominated for the Oscar for Best Documentary Feature. Her films have played in festivals around the world, from South by Southwest to Berlin, and her most recent feature documentary is now streaming on Netflix. It's called Strip Down, Rise Up. Our conversation covers Michelle's extraordinary journey building her career, breaking into the industry, and of course, the art of documentary filmmaking. This is The Catalyst, I'm Cassius, and in these conversations, we seek to deconstruct successful people's journeys, particularly focusing on those turning points, those catalysts that help them become who they are. I hope you enjoy. Michelle, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you after we've had quite a journey getting to know each other, um, personally, professionally, as we've made a documentary together. Now we're in post on a yet to be announced, but very exciting, very inspiring project. And um, let me just start off by thanking you for the instrumental role that you've played in bringing it to life and helping position it to make the impact that I know we all want it to have. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. Of course. It was my pleasure. It was really a lot of fun working on the film. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple of questions for you that um, I thought would maybe be just awkward to ask unless we were in the confines of an interview. But um, I wanted to start at the beginning and um, ask you how you discovered filmmaking. So I always say that it discovered me. I wasn't at all on the track to make films. I actually was fascinated by theater. And um, first of all, let me say my parents have nothing to do with films or television or theater. We didn't even have a television. My parents were adamant about not having a TV. And, um, but they had a love of French cinema. So I was around love of films from the beginning. Um, and when I was 12 years old, I started, I like to boss people around. So I started directing my friends uh, in the neighborhood and I put a, a theater play together and I thought, oh, I like this. Telling people what to do, stand here, say this, whatever. And that continued until today, <laughs> uh, pretty much. But um, I was, um, I graduated high school. I was a little young, uh, meaning I was 17 and a half in my army. Um, uh, draft was right when I was 18. They can't draft you before. So I had six months before the army in Israel and um, my mother arranged for me an internship uh, in the Israeli television. And I was sitting and watching an editor do her work. And I was just blown away by, at that time it was film. So we were still syncing picture and sound. And I was blown away by the mechanics of it and the technicality of it. And how is it possible that the, the audio is here and the video is here and she puts it together. And then I was just like, this is everything I wanted to do. We, I didn't know because theater is so two dimensional. And here was an opening for something much bigger with a lot more imagination and creativity. Mm -hmm. And so right after the army, I, enrolled for Tel Aviv University. That was the first uh, course that they did for hands-on film. And I uh, was one of the few lucky ones that got in. And what was it out of curiosity? Like, you know, you mentioned that even at a young age, you liked bossing people around, which is a, a funny way to describe it. But like <laughs> the, the way that I understand that is you had an idea for something that you wanted to do or see, and you had the, you know, the courage or the lack of uh, self-doubt to like go about rallying other people to bring that vision to life. Is that when you started studying filmmaking was, did you make the connection that like that pe was that piece of it foundational to what you fell in love with about filmmaking or what was it about filmmaking itself that you were like inspired by? Yeah. So it was fulfilling two parts of my brain, which 
um, are still there. One is very technical and very practical, and one is very creative and imaginative. And that's kind of the person I am in life too. I have those two sides and I found a medium that combined the two. So it was, it was first of all, what kind of story I want to tell. And I had burning stories to tell and burning characters to describe, but I also was interested in how to tell the story not just what to tell. And those two were combined in film. So my, I remember my first theater play was about my life in Morocco. Um, my, <laughs> the housekeeper I missed so much, which was Arab and I was, the whole, the whole play was about her. Then <laughs> um, this was a very new thing for kids my age because they were not Moroccans and they had no clue what this immigration looked like. And as an immigrant, that was always a key motive in my stories, always, um, in some hidden or not so hidden form. Mm -hmm. And so those stories carried on to when I started really making films. And I started um, telling stories about the underdog, which I was very much uh, identifying with. And people had no voice. Um, as, uh, as a Moroccan immigrant in Israel, we, we really did not have a voice. Not only we didn't have a voice, but our voice was considered inferior. And so they were shutting us down and telling us, your culture is not good enough. You know, we are from East Europe, we're better. <laughs> and so um, I, I have to tell you that one of my biggest motivators, which is a funny story and not so funny, maybe. Uh, when I was doing the interview at Tel Aviv University and I passed all the tests, it was pretty rigorous and whatever. And um, one of my there he became my teacher um asked me so what does a moroccan girl want to do in a film business I'm like, i was so shocked by the question <laughs> like today it will be a black person or a white person of color right. i was so shocked that in my head i think that kind of created an enormous urge to show them what i was made of and mm -hmm. i was like okay i'm going to show you I'm going to show you what I'm made of. And um, that was always in the back of my mind. Like, it's, I'm not just telling stories for me. I'm telling stories for my entire tribe. And um, it's been a huge uh, engine for my drive to continue uh, for all these years. I mean, we're talking 40 years. Uh, and every time I want to quit, I remember, no, I got, I, if I don't do this, who will? Um, so this kind of storytelling, that's an ancient drive. Think about it when the storyteller started and how everybody was around the campfire. I want to create that campfire through my films and everybody's listening and passing it on to the next generation. And just knowing how, maybe it wasn't as apparent at the time, but um, I think now that you know we have different levels of experience, but we've both been in the entertainment industry and seen how difficult it is to build a career um how inefficient it is how far from a meritocracy at least in my opinion um it it truly is is that desire to sort of prove people wrong and prove your people right would you say like how important was that to sustaining your motivation to like keep going because i can only imagine in a career like yours that spans so many projects and multiple decades like there must have been moments where you questioned you know whether you were going to continue in the industry well, for sure, but I still do. Yeah. There's a that was the underline. This this what I told you was the underline, but the the bottom line and the upper line was that I wanted to fulfill myself, and that was the only way I knew how I can be fulfilled by telling stories that matter, stories that have an emotional impact, um, mostly intimate stories that tell a bigger picture, whether it's historical, social, economic, or whatever. Um, that people can identify with. And because imagine, I mean, one of my films, Steal a Pencil for me, is about a couple of fell in love in the Holocaust. When you say the word Holocaust, you can't grasp it, but you can grasp it if it's told through a love story and you understand the details of the everyday life. Um, so my, my biggest motivation was to create some kind of impact on people so that they can either, either create awareness um, for people to ask questions for people to question their beliefs. And maybe if I'm so lucky to take action um, after they see a film. And that happened in most counts and that was the most fulfilling part. 
I mean, think about it. We work two, three years, sometimes four, to make a movie, and then it just goes like this. And you, 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 you watch it with the audience, and they love it. You go to festivals, and they love it, and then it's done. <laughs> so, right? It's like like cooking a meal for ten hours. That's eaten in five minutes. The same thing. So you really have to love it. And I really love it. And um, the possibilities and the encounters, and I know you do, you know that because you've just gone through it with people you would never meet otherwise. Um, the camera gives me power is a bad word sometimes, but it is the right word here. It's a positive power to get into places I would never go otherwise. Like I was in the middle of South Central on the streets between the Crips and the Bloods shooting and talking to gang members like well and everybody's like let's get out of here and i'm like no 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 what's wrong and the camera if i was without a camera i would just be running away but that give you gives you that power to um to get in there and to really understand how these people live and bring that to the world you know i'm i'm really excited to ask you some technical questions but um before we get into that i just want to um, sort of arc out the trajectory of your career. So you started uh, at, at film school in Israel. Right. Um, if I understand correctly, you actually started in narrative filmmaking, scripted filmmaking with uh, um, pressure. Is that how, was that your first sort of uh, major project? And how did, maybe give us some sense of the interplay between the scripted projects and then um, your explorations and beginnings in documentary filmmaking? So I see you did your homework. I was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> um, pressure was my graduation film uh, it was a featurette a love story between Arab and a Jew at the time where that was pre-intifada so the the word Palestinian or anything like that was taboo <laughs> um, it was based on a girlfriend of mine who actually had a boyfriend who was Arab and even though her surrounding and her family was very liberal the moment she became his girlfriend, the pressure was immense to a point where they had to split. So that was my inspiration for that film. I And like I said, I wanted to make, uh, tell stories that mattered and to show Arab people as human beings, that they are the same as everybody else. And it was important to me to um, not cast a Jew in the role of Arab. So it was a lot of casting search to find an Arab actor who was willing to work with a Jewish woman in a film. That wow. That on itself was a challenge. And so I took, uh, I, I wrote the script and uh, got a grant from the, the film fund in Israel and, and started to, to film. And it was important for me to be as authentic as possible because if you are representing a minority, you want to, them to talk in their own voice, in their own environment rather than me thinking, saying what they think. Um, so, uh, in the film, they are he's bringing her to his village to witness his life and how the culture is. So I, I actually took the actors to the village. She didn't even know where we were going because I wanted to get her real reaction. That's dope. And she was as white as they come and, you know, Ashkenazi Jew. And all of a sudden she's going not knowing where. And I planted them in the village and got the real reaction. So it's, if you will, it's like a docu-narrative, but I wanted that authentic feeling. And her honest and her first reaction was absolutely important for the film. And his awkwardness bringing a Jewish woman to his village was even more. And, you know, you could feel the tension already there. Like, why are you bringing her? What is she doing here? Man? So that represented already the essence of the film. Um, yeah, I was, I was set out to do, uh, uh, narrative films, but I realized that in the time in Israel where the conflict was burning and, and it was becoming unbearable, I didn't think I had the luxury to do like, oh yeah, let me, let me do a nice comedy or I, I felt, you know, um, engaged and uh, on a mission to tell the stories that nobody else would and got into refugee camps and got into um, a very tough uh, university under uh, military um, closure, uh, snuck in there, got arrested, whatever. But that was for me. <laughs> I was bailed by the dean of the, the my faculty. It was embarrassing. Um, but I wanted to 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 tell the stories from the point of view of those who really have no opportunity to tell the stories. And 
And I, you know, sometimes got in trouble because it was not allowed. And there were certain words like Palestinian state were not allowed. And so I had to choose show the movie and endanger my people or not show the movie. And that, that's a tough choice I had to make as a filmmaker. But of course, people's life were more important. So I had, I had to shelf that, that movie that was very rebellious. Oh, you had to shelve it? No way. So that was your first documentary? No, I made my first documentary was about a portrait of an Arab actor who was trying to make it in Tel Aviv. Uh-huh. And I followed his struggle to, he was torn between the two worlds. He wanted to make a career as an actor, but his culture was in the way. And being in Tel Aviv was like, what are you doing here? You know, right. it, was, it was that time, it was the 80s. Um, so that was my first. And then the second I did in the West Bank, um, in a refugee camp where uh, students were trying to finish their studies, but were accused of being terrorists and they had to live with that. And how do you live with that? And so that was under military occupation. And that's why I snuck in with my crew. But I've done some crazy stuff. But without a camera, I would have never done it. <laughs> it kind of gives you a different level of uh, liquid courage, you know, almost having the camera in your hand. That's right. That's right. And I've been there several times, you know, either my film or films I produce for other people. I was like the expert on the West Bank. Um, out of curiosity, Michelle, are there... You know, when you get to a point um, in your career where you have so much experience, um, but you also have not just experience creating your own projects as a director and as a producer, but also now um, working with younger uh, directors, uh, less experienced filmmakers, what are the things that maybe intuitively that you did well at the beginning of your career that you still do, but maybe in a more advanced way now? And what are some of the things that like the mis big mistakes you made early on whether it's technical or practical in terms of uh, from a filmmaking approach? Many mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my, my career has been very interesting because I was, I came to Los Angeles in the early nineties, or actually late eighties where women directors were, has had really nothing to do in the industry. It was a real struggle to a point where I co-founded an organization called Cine Women, where we kind of decided to employ ourselves, or employ each other. And that's how I made my first documentary. It was A Wonderful Life and uh, continued in that path, even though my path was narrative. But once you do a doc, you're kind of closed in this category. And that was that. And I was like, fine. Um, so I was, a lot of my energy and my time was to just find my place as a female director and go on job interviews and compete with guys who had less experience, but were guys. And that was really um, frustrating and sometimes defeating. Um, but I decided, okay, I don't need you. I'm just going to make my own and raise my own money, made my own films. And I can tell you that, you know, when I guest lecture at universities or whatever, I always say, follow your passion because some people want to make their first film for the real, you know, how I'm going to show my work and I can show all these toys I have. That's not the point. The point is do something that you care about so that if you make mistakes, you make mistakes that you are behind rather than mistakes from for something you fabricated to get more work. It just doesn't work. So everything you do, do it from your heart. And sometimes your heart will clash with the people who finance or whatever. And you have to be diplomatic about it. But at the end of the day, you have to follow your instincts. No one else is. Um, so uh, other filmmakers that I either coach or mentor or work with, um, it is important that I can help them get in touch with that instinct and intuition. Um, and sometimes it's very hard because the pressure is on and you have a schedule and you have millions of producers and all of that. Um, and you also have notions from other mediums that you bring into the doc. Um, but the documentary is is a very, is a craft on its own. It's nothing like news. It's nothing like reality. It's nothing like narrative. It is purely based on intuition. Like, when do you feel something's going to happen? When do you think somebody's going to say something interesting and you need to be there? And, you know, we have many moments on the set where I was like, Cassius, we got to be there now. It's going to, something's going to happen there. And we were running to the other side. And that's what experience brings, being in tune with your intuition without distraction, interference, 
and um, convenience. Sometimes it's not convenient to follow intuition. And how do you how do you know how do you hone your intuition? How do you know when like what your intuition is? You know, because sometimes, like you mentioned, there's a lot of noise. Um, like, right. what's the difference between a fleeting thought and your intuition? How can you internally differentiate between the two different thought impulses? Really good question. Um, I always um, think about it as, is that impulse or is that intuition? Impulse is something that's going to go away in five seconds, and I never think about it again. So I know that I was not worth following. But intuition keeps nagging, you know, like, and if you don't do it, it can be small, it can be big. It just, if you don't do it, it just keeps coming, keeps coming. And then you have to have the courage to say, no, I really need to do this right now. Um, I need to go with Tatiana in the elevator right now because you guys can deal with lunch and I, I got to go now. And those are the tough decisions sometimes because especially when the crews are the way they are today in America, they're big and you can't be mobile and you have people in frame everywhere you turn. It's it's just not the way I like to work. And and it's so interesting hearing you break that down because that was something that really surprised me was uh, every time you said you decided to voice, hey, my intuition is telling me that we should do this. Um, and we followed it every time and you were right every time. And it was, was, like, <laughs> it was really surprising uh, how accurate it was. And um, that's why I'm curious to know, because I feel like um, one of the big challenges, especially early on, is uh, having the confident, like the differentiation between confidence and arrogance and like understanding as a storyteller and as a filmmaker, this is important to me. And this is a this is a battle I'm going to fight because I feel like your whole career as a filmmaker is one long war and each each project is its own battle and then within each project there are a thousand individual skirmishes and so you you get to a point where you, especially with your collaborators you know you're you're battling with them and at some point you're wondering is this a battle i really want to fight so is the is it does it come back to intuition and like what would you say are the priorities as you look at the important things that ha that ingredients that make a great documentary how do you rank those things in order of i'm going to go to bat and fight over this thing that's important to me first is the content i don't care about anything else or anybody else if i if i feel like there is something i need to get whether it's a shot or a scene or whatever i am going to go get it and everybody can Sorry, I gotta get, I gotta, there's no time to discuss it. I just have to go. And that's why I work with a small crew and it's a crew I chose. And I ended up being very independent because of that, because I don't wanna have to answer to people who have less experience than me, who don't know the characters like I do, or in your case that you do. Um, and we really relied on your relationship with Tatiana. The one thing I want to say with intuition, because you asked me, how do you get in tune with your intuition? It takes a lot of experience, but it also takes tremendous amount of focus. Tremendous mm. amount of focus. When I'm directing on set, people ask me, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, what? Yeah, of course I'm okay. I'm not, something happened. No, I'm just really focused. <laughs> um, I'm not listening to chicha. I'm not listening to anything. I'm like this. At the end of the day, I crash, there is nothing left in me um, because I operate on six cents, not, you know, and that six cents is what's gonna get you those gems um, that sometimes you're gonna miss, but it is a, a struggle every minute on set to be in tune and to not let anything be in your way. Um, so no phones, no like, you can't, this has to be gone. And that's why you have a, if you can have a good producer, so you don't have to look at your phone and you don't have to communicate with the talent and you don't have to arrange anything. That's an ideal situation where you can just be focused on what's in front of you and nothing, nothing else. Not just what's in front of you, but what's going to be in front of you two hours from now. Right. That's what you, you know, that's what you have to, to plan ahead or have somebody behind you who plans for you. Um, those are intuition and focus are the main thing. 
in terms of the order priority, um, it's not about how much money you have or which camera you have. Um, to me, the most important thing after my content thing is the DP. The DP? The DP, the DP is your eyes and ears uh, because when I'm looking there to see if something else is happening, she's looking over here and catching the story. And DP has to be a storyteller as much as you are. And, and what are those qualities? Like if you haven't worked with a DP before and let's say your go-to DP is unavailable, what are you, how are you going to evaluate if a DP is the right, is right for your story for documentary? Like how are you actually evaluating their capability to do what you need them to do on, on a documentary set? So um, other than Teo, who did big narrative films, but was starting documentaries, so knew exactly the language of documentaries that I barely had to tell him anything, um, experience. So the DPs I've worked with, uh, uh, the last film, Strip Down, Rise Up, I had three female DPs. Also because it was a sensitive subject, so I didn't want to bring too many guys into the room. But um, my DPs were 20 to 30, had 20, 30 years experience in documentary only. They would, did not, they don't do narratives. They are documentary animals. Like and what's I the am. difference? What's the difference? Like, how do they express that differently? So first of all, the storytelling part, if you're doing a narrative, you have a script and you're relying on the actors to do the mise-en-scene, the director is, you know, you know, marking everything. So you know what you're gonna do. It's gonna preset. There's not a lot of place for intuition um, other than, you know, the visual. Here, you don't have any uh, rehearsal, any pre-take, any nothing. So you gotta be there in the moment and understand how the story unfolds. I worked with DP in countries where they didn't even speak the language and knew exactly when to pan up to the face and get the, the emotion. It was unbelievable. It's that same intuition I'm talking about the DP has to have. Um, it is. It has to be a people's person. They have to be quiet because the loud DP is, yeah, we're going to come in and we're going to put the lamp here. And then the subject, if they had an emotional moment, that was gone. And you know, <laughs> you've seen it on set. Well, you know, yeah. Um, very subtle, very um, invisible, and just good storytellers. And I can tell it from the way they shoot and, and, and talking to other filmmakers and their experiences, but also talking to editors because they are the ones who get the raw footage. Mm. I have some trusted editors I work with. And I was like, Kate, what do you think about Sandra? She was like, Sandra is amazing. Every shot I got, I, I could use, or 90% I could use. I don't need to know more than that. So in your mind, and, and you brought up something that I think is really interesting, which is depending on the subject matter and where you're going to be shooting, there might be certain DPs that are more appropriate. So like you mentioned strip down or rise up. And one thing that really stands out is um, the spaces that that documentary takes place in and where you're shooting are almost completely filled with women. Um, and so it's, if you, if you start bringing in a lot of male energy in the crew, you might, start disrupting what just is naturally occurring in the world that you're capturing. And I feel like that to me is the biggest difference between um, narrative scripted filmmaking and documentary filmmaking is in one, you're creating a world and in the other, you're sort of capturing reality through a specific lens, you know? And, um, and in addition, you're creating a safety place right. where a safe place where they can actually express their world to your world. And that's the connection that, that needs to happen. And the safe space is uh, is created by trust. And that's another thing I, I really should have mentioned in the beginning, that is a key element is trust. Trust, you have Tatiana's trust, which was an amazing asset and bond. And by the way, this was one reason I wanted to be in this project because I knew that this right. without this trust, there's no movie. Right. So. Number one, trust. And that trust has to be proven every day again and again and again and again because you're going to be tested as a director. Mm -hmm. They are trusting you. By the way, that's true also for narrative, that you're not going to make a fool out of them, that yeah. you're going to deal with the subject with integrity, that you're not going to micro-moor them, that you're, you know, all these things that you have to 
every time show again that you are worth the trust is where you put the camera is how much you invade the space and i can tell you i am ruthless about um not invading the space but trying to get my story because it's happening and it's the reality i'm not fabricating it so i want to be there and i want to witness it and sometimes it's not comfortable for them you know how many times you said you know back off it's not the right time for tatiana half of the time i would have gone in yeah no i think you're I see you anymore. no you're, you're, i think you're absolutely right to, that now looking back at production like if in the case of this documentary um tatiana and i were able to develop a really close friendship over the course of you know two and a half years before we like re before a full crew came in to start documenting her life um and it's it really is like it's part being a director in a documentary i feel like is partly being an entrepreneur partly being a storyteller um and then partly i feel like it's also being a psychologist and like a friend to your subject so that you can start because I feel like some one of the most important things is being able to anticipate how they might react to this. Like you mentioned, I think you used the word invasion of privacy and like invasion of their space. There's that delicate line between they're still going to go ahead and live their life and they're opening some portion of it to you to capture. But you have to always remember that there is that life outside of the frame that if you're infringing on that and not anticipating how they're going to react to the different things that you're doing in their world, it might impact, you know, how open they're going to be in their interview and stuff like that. Um, right, I'm, but you, I'm, then you give them permission. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm demonstrating one of my major failures as a documentary filmmaker, which is I my questions are longer than the answers that I hope to get. How do you approach interviews um, as a filmmaker? What are you, how do you approach it to get the best interviews possible? I just want to go back to what you said. I do not become friends with my subject mm. because otherwise I have to be extra careful not to hurt their, their feelings or whatever, which I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I have to think three times before I ask something. I ask, can I do this? Can I do that? So I don't befriend my subject. I am creating trust, but there is a distance that allows me to make mistakes and to say, oh, sorry, I was too close. But to avoid that, I tell them beforehand, if there is any time that you feel I'm too close or invading your privacy, please let me know and we can talk about it. Thanks for clarifying that. That's really useful. So that, that's, that's that. Because when you come to set, you have almost too much information as a friend that you know and have seen, but I have not seen it as an audience. So right. I need that information. But you think, oh yeah, I got this, I got this. But Maybe you didn't, maybe because you witnessed it, but you didn't really film it. So the lines can get blurry. So I try to keep as fresh as possible when I come in. Um, so interviews, um, research, of course, um, res as much research as I can to know what what they got, you know, why, why they're doing what they're doing, um, where they come from. Is there a personal... Um, triggering point that I can uh, hit that will be a shortcut to opening the heart the way I want them to open rather than ask, you know, a lot of questions and exhaust them to a point where they just want it to be over. And that's always what's an example. What's an example of the shortcut like that? Over shortcut. Oh, yeah. um, so I had a very tough subject <laughs> Um, when I did SOS State of Security, that was Richard Koch, who was, you know, a very experienced security guy, White House, uh, ran the whole 9-11 crisis, very closed person, very closed. And I could not crack him. I just could not crack him. And um, I was trying this way, this way, that way, that way, that way. It was like very uh, untrusting person, you know, security guy. Um, and all my tricks didn't work. Like sometimes I, I wanted to film very day with him, but he wasn't up for it. He just only interviews. So I would come in and tell my DP, you know, to shoot from the hip, you know, the old trick, shoot from the hip. So you can, and he was so alert that he saw you like, what are you doing? <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> so I tried. Right. But then I realized from research that his real trigger point was Vietnam vets. 
that mm. he was so angry about how they were treated that there was no, there were no words to describe. So I, I thought, okay, I'm going to keep that for the end. And then I started to talk about Vietnam vets and now everything came up. I, I, you're bringing up something that I think is really uh, relevant to note, which is like, it's easy to get so caught up in what you want to get as a filmmaker that you kind of forget the very artificial and um, oftentimes uncomfortable position that an interview subject is being put in, you know, when they're being asked intimate questions about their life or about things that... Um, let, let God forbid if there was controversy or, or anything else. So I, I think you're absolutely, it's helpful to hear that through research, you found the th that topic that was going to maybe emotionally involve them in such a way that they were able to let their guard down and speak more from their heart. Yeah. And also you don't want to overdo the pre-interviews because then you lose all the freshness of the camera because they want to tell you already everything in the pre-interview. And then when you come to set, they feel like they've said it already. So right. it's a fine balance between minimal interviews so that you know if the subject is right, if they, how comfortable they are in front of the camera. But I'll give you an example, like when I was shooting the, the couple who survived the Holocaust and I went to their house, she had a very devastating story of a boyfriend in, in her youth that they lived in Amsterdam and you know they were 15, 16, but very much in love. and. Uh, when he got to be about 18 years old, the war broke out and he got an offer to work in IBM in the United States. And they were so much in love and they didn't understand that the, the danger of the war. And she told him, don't go, stay with me, you know, we'll eventually get married and we'll live a life together. This is going to pass and whatever. And then, you know, when the Nazis occupied Holland, he was one of the first one to get captured and die. So that, yeah, so that guilt had lived with her for the rest of her life, that if she had let him go to America, the love of her life would still be alive. Can you imagine living with wow. us? She married somebody else in the meantime, of course, but, and she told me beforehand, she said, I am not going to talk about Rudy. That's the boyfriend. I said, okay, we're not going to talk about Rudy. And I'm not going to talk about all the pain I went through. I don't want to go back there. I was like, okay, we're not going to talk about it. So I did three days of intensive interviews because they were, she was 80 and he was 90 and I was afraid to lose them. So I'm like, I'm just going to cover everything. In three days intensive at their house. And I'm not asking about Rudy. Day three she starts to talk about Rudy. I didn't even ask. And she just goes with it all the way, like how she felt, how this prevented her from having joy in her life and this and that. Cathartic moment for her and the whole crew was like on the floor in tears. And those are the moments where you feel you have done your job, not just because you have brought the story to the world, but you literally helped the subject go through a transformation just by being there and being supportive and creating a safe space right. where they can actually tell the story. And after that, her very grown kid said, we, we don't understand what happened to our mom. She's just free. She's walking around the house naked. I was <laughs> going through it. She's just free. <laughs> everything. And um, that was one of those beautiful moments that you, by being patient, you you get it, you get it. Um, that's really, so, that's yeah. a powerful, powerful anecdote. It's and powerful. You, you, had you earned the trust, you earned her trust and she saw, okay, she's going to respect my request to not talk about it. And probably over the course of two days, you let her get so many other things that maybe weren't quite so dear, but were still tough to talk about off her chest in a way that felt respectful that she was, she, you know, you created the space for her to walk into that topic on her own, you know? Yeah. And I mean, another example, which is interesting, when I was doing Carlos straight up in South Central after the riots, um, I was following, you know, mostly Black and Latino kids in a program in Jordan High School a very in the middle of gang world, world and war um, who were trying to change their lives around through the performing arts. And so I told them, if something happens in, in your life, call me. 
And I was, we were on our way to film an interview. And, and, and were you more specific than that? Or did you just tell it to them like that? You just said, if anything, because oh, that's I something that, yeah, that's a really important part of the process is like, hey, I'm not living your life with you. So I don't know if something is going to happen. That's interesting. Right. And you have to tell me. And by the way, the last thing they want to think about is me or the film when something does happen. Right. So I'm constantly in touch with them, constantly. And um, uh, kind of making sure I have information every day. Oh, what's happening today? So that day we were going to shoot something completely different. Luckily I had a crew and Queenie, one of the girls said, Michelle, you, I can't, I can't be in the shoot today because there is a funeral. My, my cousin who's 16 was shot in the drive-by and I, you know, obviously. And so I was like, I, this is like everything I'm talking about in the film is happening right now. And I'm here in my beautiful house in Hollywood Hills and I need to be there right now. And so intuition, right? So I'm like, how do I make this happen? So I called- Same me. day, right? Yeah. Huh? Same day. Same day, same hour. Yeah. I'm like, Queenie, um, I know this is ridiculous, but I need to ask you, how can I film the funeral? And she's like, are you crazy? They're all black people. You you can't get in there. And it's not my, you know, my, I have to ask. I cannot give you that permission. I said, Queenie, please. I know this is not, but this is for the bigger picture. Can you ask somebody in the family if we can film? And by then I've filmed them for a year. So we had a very close relationship. They came to my house. And, um, so she asked. And the mother or the aunt, I don't remember said that we can come down in one condition that I'll give them footage of the funeral. Absolutely. So now we're rerouting the crew. We're going down to South Central racing. We're coming in literally church, all black people, South Central. And we are like, you know, three people, me, DP sound, that's it, no one else. Um, and we're coming in and we're like going and near with everybody and the casket and the, and the screaming and the thing and my dp couldn't even film because the tears were streaming down he couldn't see what was going on we were all like and i felt like that was so important because nobody sees it from this kind of point of view you hear about it in tv you right. know white shot but i was there i mean if you ever see close up you'll see i mean my camera was literally on top of this 16 year old beautiful kid how yeah, else are you going to tell the story right so being in that moment was huge absolutely huge and i have I, you're you're gone at 2:30 your time right yeah what time is it okay yeah. we got I just over a little more okay i have like I have two questions that, that directly relate to that. One is from a directorial standpoint, how do you cover a, how do you cover a scene to know that you have enough to tell the story of the scene in the edit? You talking about a very scene, I assume. Yeah, a very scene. So to me, coverage is everything because, but again, intuition, like your your camera is right here and it's going and you're afraid to move to catch another angle because you don't want to miss something important. So let's use the example let's use the example of the of the funeral scene that you were just talking about which is you don't have time to plan that scene out. That's pure no. intuition, such a critical scene, emotional. How are you cover what coverage do you need to get to tell that scene the right way? Okay, so first I need to know who is the center of the scene. Right. The dead boy is the center of the scene. Who is in the background? The family. I need to turn around. I need to see the family. I need to see the mother crying. That's what's the wider picture. Oh, the preacher. He's preaching about not revenging, not, you know, using, okay, I got it, you know, the preacher. What are the central characters of the scene, just like in narrative? What is the setup? Where are we? Um, so I need to have one master shot to know where I am. Okay, I'm in the church. Where is the church? In South Central, I need to show that. And then narrow it down to, to the character. The camera, okay, so there is a balance between being a restful camera, which I like, I don't like this, and at the same time, camera moving so you can get your angles, right? Um, so once the shot 
has enough links that I can use it, that I know I have enough content um, on this subject, then I instruct my DPO, sometimes they do it on their own, to move and get the other side or get you know the surroundings and all this. It's a very, very strong collaboration between me and the DP. I don't walk away and let them shoot a scene. That never happens. Unless it's a stupid, you know, lecture that I have to film. I'm I am so close to the DP, whispering constantly in her ear, do this, do this, do this, do that. When you finish this shot, pan to the right because I think something's gonna happen or somebody's gonna walk in. It's a constant communication, which is not usual in normal docs. Uh, this is that feature docs are like that. Mm -hmm. And like when you, uh, so you described getting the coverage within the scene to set up, are you typically getting your exteriors and like your establishing shots? Do you try and do that before the scene commences, after, on another day? Like, do you have a rule of thumb for? I, I try to do it first. Right. Because I we always forget at the end. We're always rushing at the end. Um, so get 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 that first. And I try to put my subject in the shot. Um, so I keep them under my supervision. <laughs> For example, Tatiana. I was like, okay, can you walk in? Yeah. And so they walk in. I know they're with me, and I walk in with them and I didn't miss anything. Um yeah, I, it's really, you know. Kind of going with them wherever they're going, it's very, very important. It's a little, lot more limited today. You need a release for every little thing you do. Right. Like in my time, it was like, oops, sorry, I didn't know that. And I'm still going <laughs> busy. Um, so those are the links between the scenes that are not part of coverage, but a transition that you need to have that are part of the character. How do they walk? How do they interact with people what do they eat for breakfast you know all these things that give you the color almost like the the in-between moments like what yes. happens in between the key scenes yes exactly yeah i and... wanted to give yeah go ahead no no go ahead go ahead no i i want to give you an example because we talked about invasion of privacy and stuff like that so in my film it was a wonderful life it was about homeless women who lived out of their cars and pretending they were still the middle upper class women that they used to be um, it was very hard because uh, there was one woman who literally had nowhere to be and was sleeping in her car in a cemetery and they were assaulted in the cemetery, you know, a woman alone in the car and she had to go there and um, so many times I was like, I'm going to take her home, I'm going to take her home, she, I can give her a shower, I can give her food, I can put her on the couch and the other side of me was like, I can't do that because I will be changing the course of the story and not telling the truth about their lives. How many homeless women have a filmmaker come into their life? No. Right. And so those are tough decisions as, as a humanist to do, to have and not interfere with their reality. That is very hard. And, um, you know, you had mentioned something to me when we were, because obviously Verite documentary, you're frequently, if not almost all the time, handheld. Um, are there certain rules of thumb that you have about shooting, like about how you like to approach actually the handheld operation of the camera? I know you mentioned you like prefer a restful camera. Something that you mentioned to me was try and get at least 10 seconds of like a clean, steady frame per shot, per setup. Um, are there other rules of thumb or things that you know that you like or need to have to make sure that you got it? I prefer camera on sticks. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, unless, unless they're moving and, you know, but in Strip Down, Rise Up, they started every time with a circle. So I had two cameras because I had to focus on the main character with the teacher. And then I had the, the women who were talking or dancing or whatever. So I had one camera on a little, um, stool that had wheels that was in the center of the circle and um and the camera was on this rig and so the dp could move very steadily and quickly between one and the other and then the um, other camera was outside of the circle on sticks on a zoom focusing on the other side whoever was talking um, and the only time we would go on handheld is when they were dancing and I had to, you know, move around the bodies and you couldn't do it with sticks. But I'd say 60% of the film is on sticks. Sticks I, I and zooms and zoom lenses? 
Zoom lenses, unless I do sit down interviews and then I use lenses, lenses, not always. Um, nowadays with interviews, I have two cameras, mm -hmm. one next to the other, yeah. uh, one wider, one closer, and the main camera moves all the time. Um, so very much unlike people work now, I, I work differently. I like to, if there is an emotional moment, there is a pushing, um, I like to pan from something and discover them. Just mm -hmm. variety. Mm -hmm. Day because you shoot on 4K or 8K, you're like, oh, we'll just punch in. But it's not the same. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it's, I mean, optically, it's very different. Um, so out of curiosity, if you were, you know, just graduating from film school now, or let's say you didn't even go to film school, but you were a young person, you had discovered documentary filmmaking, you watched you know, strip down, rise up. And you're like, that's the kind of thing that I want to do. What advice would you have? Or how would you approach building a career, launching a career as a documentary filmmaker today in 2023? Shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> do as much as you can. Don't wait for the money. Don't wait for anything. Um, just go pick a subject that you care about. Pick, pick a story or a character that you care about. And then go in and film it and whatever it takes. If it's an iPhone, do it on an iPhone. Just show your ability and your talent to tell a story in an innovative way. And by and then people will see it, you'll get noticed. Then, you know, it's not about getting an agent. Agent don't do much for you. Um, it's more like creating a network of people that will appreciate your work and that you can be visible to them in case they you know, they have a film and keep working, just producing stuff that people will notice, oh, this person doesn't stop. That means they have it in their blood and in their DNA to just continue telling stories, whether they get money or they don't. And that's- That's, that's such a key, that's <laughs> such a key point that I could not agree with more. I feel like the entertainment industry, you know, there's so many people that come in with with dreams and aspirations of doing something. And the people that actually work in the industry, like the executives, the corporate types who control the flow of money typically and the flow of distribution, like they've seen a million of these types of people come and go, but the people that stand out are the ones that don't need their help. They just continue self-generating projects for long enough that by the time you'd actually don't need their help is when they start offering their help. It's one of the most interesting. That's categories. exactly what happened to me. That's exactly what happened to me for decades. I was like on my own, raising money, raising money. And then Netflix started to come to me. Yeah. You have, what do you want to do? I'm like, Oh, where were you two years ago? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't exist. But you know, the, 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 the funny story is that Ted Surrenders from Netflix called me. I don't know when Color Straight Up was already done and was nominated, was on the shelf, done the whole festival, TV, whatever. And he called me in my living room. He's like, oh, I have this company. It's called Red Envelope, Red, Red Envelope Entertainment. We do, uh, we know we send DVDs by mail. I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. What do you want from me? And he goes, oh, what do you have? I'm like, well, I have a few films that have gone through the circles and it's just sitting there. It's like, I want to have it. He gave me, I don't know, a thousand bucks. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but I had nothing to lose. And we started a relationship. Um, and they have been my family since then. Uh, that's, you you know, my instinct was that's a great program. I, I kind of want to be part of it. Um, but the idea is to stay authentic, Cassius. And that we're so bogged down by social media and marketing and PR yeah. and the Hollywood Reporter and blah, blah, blah. It's not important. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you think if you were starting your career right now that you would be more focused on creating short documentaries that you could self-release and let's say build an audience for yourself on YouTube, for example, or building longer form projects that like let's say making short documentaries that are that more serve as proof of concepts for let me go and raise, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, whatever it is um to make a longer form version of it or would you be doing both I never, did, I never did that i just started shooting and continued even if i had to stop and raise money and continued i think it's a waste of time to do a proof of concept unless you have no choice um 
it's it, the time you put in in trying to shoot that stuff and edit that stuff and the, the resources. I mean, in your film, it was a huge amount of money. And of course, it helped get HBO, thankfully, but most of the time it doesn't. Yeah. And so now you wasted a hundred thousand dollars and you could have made a whole movie with it. <laughs> Seriously, with starts and stops, but still you can make it. Um, I've done movies like this. I mean, Cabo de la Mor, Yeah. I was like, I'm not waiting. Things are happening. I'm going to shoot. And I went and shot. And then showtime came. Um, do, no, do you, I would not do short content. Do you feel like because you talked about, you know, people only come to offer their help in the entertainment industry once you kind of are at a point where you don't need it. You, you, you know, you mentioned like you just start going on a project and, and you, you know, there's almost this trust that you have in your own ability to execute and complete something. But what I've noticed is in my own career, like the more I've approached projects from the standpoint of let me design my approach to this in such a way that no one can stop me from making it, even if it's a much lower budget, much more stripped down version of it. Um, it sort of generates its own momentum in a way. And uh, that's one thing that I'm really curious to just get your thoughts on is generating that sense of momentum. Is that something you think about? And is that part of your approach to building projects? No, because my passion is there and my passion is that I don't need to generate passion. The passion is there. And if it's not there, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to spend two years on it. So it's like getting up in the morning and going, I really need to shoot this. I need to go to Mexico and shoot. How? I don't know. I I'll give you an example. Cabo del Moore. We started. I got the rights from the guy. I'm going home. I'm like, okay, great. I told him next time you do a matchmaking let me know when i'm thinking six months i get time to raise money da, da, da. literally a few weeks later he calls me he says michelle i have this client and he's willing to be filmed and i don't know if i'm gonna have another one I'm like <laughs> so i i was like how do i how do i do this i you know i don't have the money and so i thought okay i thought i'm going to take my little high definition cam Instead of getting a DP and a sound, I, I, I literally calculated it cost me 50 grand with going to Mexico and everything. Like, I don't have it. So I didn't know if it was, if there was a movie even. So I took my little HD and I filmed. I went with him to Mexico. I told you I struggled with the sound, but it still worked and everything. <laughs> I didn't speak Spanish. <laughs> and I came back and I said to my partner then who was, was a DP I said okay there's good news and there's bad news the good news is the research turned into a movie the movie is there <laughs> bad news shot on my little HD by yours truly that didn't matter it didn't matter and so that was the seed and then we raised money and then we used the better cameras or whatever but I still continued to shoot in Mexico my own on my own camera and we made it a stylistic choice that everything that was shot in Mexico looked a little less elegant because I shot it on a little HD and mini HD. And what was shot in America with the groom with this capitalistic uh, structure was much more clean and beautiful and steady. And that worked stylistically. So you just have to start. It's interesting how those things tend to happen. Um, you've you've had a lot of recognition, I think, throughout your career. You know, you've won film festivals all over the world. You've won South by Southwest, and you're an Oscar-nominated filmmaker. Out of curiosity, um, I think probably every filmmaker, anyone that's ever picked up a camera has dreamed about um, getting an Oscar nomination and kind of like getting that recognition from the Academy. Did anything surprise you about how things did or didn't change um, after you were Oscar nominated for Color Straight Up? Because of the award, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, it changed a lot. I mean, you you just get that stamp that gives you a lot of legitimacy and and um, credibility, which really is not shouldn't be like that. There are a lot of amazing filmmakers who never got an Oscar or were even nominated. Um, but the tour that I did, first of all, the agents swarming over me, like, oh, don't sign with this guy. I'll send you a limo to bring me to to bring you to dinner. Don't sign with it. And uh, the noise started. And then 
you do the, the the tour of all the production companies. Oh, we want to work with you. What do you have? We want to work with you. Uh, two years I wasted on that. I didn't make one movie. Two years, wow. the agent put me in front of everybody in the world. Um, nothing came out of it. After two years, I'm like, fuck that. I'm going to make another movie. I don't want to have another meeting. And that so was they, kind of the opposite of your approach. Huh? It was kind of like the opposite of your approach up to that point in your career where you were generating your own projects and then yeah. creating the space for other people to come in as opposed to seeing what other people had for you, right? That's right. That's right. And, and you know, I also, um, so, you know, part of my movies have an educational component. So most of my movies, not straight down right up, but at that time, I would create with my team a curriculum for the school. Mm. It was very important to me. So Carlos Straight Up, we created a curriculum with LAUSD. Um, we, we went, we did a version for the classroom. I would tour, I, for two years, I toured in high schools and schools around the, the country uh, with, my, with my cast from South Central. And they have they're experiencing an amazing, amazing life going through, you know, being the celebrities, but also really hitting on issues of trust and race and uh, living in America. And so it's very important to me to have that. It was a wonderful life was the same. We created a charity anyway. So I spent a lot of time after making the film, just touring with the film. And we had support from celebrities morgan and dustin hoffman everybody wanted to be part of this school tour so that was amazing but i didn't make a movie i just it was what i wanted to do i wanted to continue that right. extension of the film um so what was <laughs> no 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 i was just curious if there were things that surprised you that did or didn't change oh. in the wake of getting that nomination but it's it, what what really stands out is that you know, you, that's like the industry, that's the industry, like really bending over backwards to try and accommodate you. But you, interestingly, it seems that you found your, it was, you still, your working method was still the one that was right for you in terms of self-generating. Yeah. I mean, look at a lot of the directors who won Best Foreign Film and came here to do a big American movie. Yeah. Because they were not authentic anymore. They lost their authenticity and uh, that doesn't work. So I think, um, I don't know about mistakes, but I learned I learned a lot by just not listening to the noise and really focusing on creating right. nothing else, not creating a marketing machine, not creating a PR machine. This It's not authentic. And the audience is very in tune with that. And they feel when something is authentic and not authentic. Never underestimate the audience. Um, and I have managed to create that kind of relationship with my invisible audience, uh, and sometimes visible in festivals, where they feel, and this is very important, they feel that they can trust the filmmaker to bring them into a world um, that they can totally surrender to without hesitancy, without doubt, without question. Like, I'm going to let him transport me to this world in South Central and Holland and this and this and that. And so when they trust the filmmaker completely, they give yourself to you, the audience. They give yourself to you and they allow themselves to be vulnerable and to be open to what you're showing them, open to emotion, open to questioning their beliefs, open. But when you are creating a marketing thing around it or within it, it doesn't work. The audience knows it and they will not trust you or trust to a point. Being authentic in documentary filmmaking, I can't tell you how crucial it is, crucial, and to the success of it. And when you, because you've described both having a genuine passion for um, a subject or a story and then approaching it with authenticity and earning the trust of your uh, audience, is there anything specific that you try to do at the beginning of a documentary to, to earn the audience's trust and get them to surrender to the story and to the world? Uh, no, I, I just know that I have to be very disciplined with myself to tell the story truthfully and from the point of view of the people I'm telling, I, I'm featuring, not my voice, their voice. Mm -hmm. Having said that, 
we're not making a reality show. So there is an interpretation that needs to be put on top of it, which is my interpretation of this reality that I'm filming. That interpretation is what the audience is going to get. Right. It has to be there, but it has to be subtle enough so you're not manipulating the audience because they're going to know it. Uh, there are filmmakers that, like Michael Moore, who will tell you in advance, I'm going to manipulate it because I'm going to tell you <laughs> only my point of view. I don't care what they're saying. It's going to be my point of view. But you know it going into it. It's at right. your own risk. In our case, it's a very delicate balance between... I am showing you the reality. I'm also going to show it to you through my lens. There is no such thing as objectivity. It's a lie because if I put the camera here and not there, it's subjective, right? If I do a close up instead of a long shot, it's subjective. I'm telling you how to look at this film, how to look at these people. So I'm not lying about it. I'm telling you, this is my point of view but there is room for your point of view as well to come in and judge for yourself because I'm giving you an authentic picture of all angles that I can access. And that's, that's, the, that's the formula almost that, that you need to follow and be very disciplined with yourself to, to not fall into this other stuff, but really be focused on what is truthful, what is important and what has impact. Impact is the main word visually technically content wise um so you don't just film but film something that has a meaning that somebody's going to feel that somebody's going to go wow i didn't know and that's where you eliminate all the stuff just shooting stuff that you're never going to see or use um no, that's great. Uh, my last question for you, Michelle, because I know you got to go is I know your last questions. <laughs> is there um is there anything, any tool, any protocol, anything that you do that maybe you learned from a mentor that you discovered, but that you do every day or almost every day that helps you be successful? What well, it could be your mental health, could be your physical health, could be a way yeah. you approach producing, etc. I start my day with meditating, whether I'm set and I have to get up at four in the morning or not. That gives me clarity of what um, I want to do, what I'm trying to achieve that day, um, or just move the clutter and the noise that I don't want to hear. So I can start the day with a clean slate and openness um, and focus. Um, the other thing um, that's important, and of course, yoga is, is you need to move your body. You can't just you know work with your head all the time. That keeps me definitely sane. Mm -hmm. By now I've uh, established a certain confidence in my ability to tell a story um, in the way I know. So I try to break away from what I know because, because I know it already. So I need to learn something new and break a genre or break away I'm filming or move into a different Subject that, you know, somebody would think, well, I would never thought you'll touch that. Always, always kind of challenge myself is, is very important to me. So I don't get bored with something I've done before. Um, but also, you know, kind of think about what have I done? What, what can I do that I haven't done before that will keep me in this business um, and not be jaded? Like you see a lot of people who are like, oh, I've done this and they become cynical. I want to keep my passion. I want to keep my passion pure. Um, and that's by just changing the box and working with other people who have passion like yourself, that your passion is contagious. So that fuels my passion and uh, gives me a meaning to like, why am I doing this and, you know, killing myself <laughs> because it's important. And that story is inspiration. And that's another thing. Inspiration is what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. I wish I had a mentor, to go back to your question. I never had a mentor, and I wish I did. The only time I had a mentor was when Robert Wise, um, the late Robert Wise, um, came to South Central and lectured my kids that I was filming about West Side Story, and they created a play called What Side Story based on that. And he continued to mentor me uh, on the narrative side. 
There are very few people that can mentor documentaries, so I don't really have those, never had. It would have been nice. Um, the other advice I would say, create a strong, small team around you that you can work with over and over again, um, that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, that they know how you work, they know how to support you, they know what you like, they know they know how you like to film things, and that's like 50% is like, makes it so much easier. They know your craziness and, you know, that for me, it's like I need coffee in the morning or else. <laughs> <laughs> Extra hot. At your own risk. <laughs> Extra hot. <laughs> Extra hot. <laughs> and Michelle, where, where can people go to follow you on social media and, and just um, see what projects you're working on and learn more about you? Um, so there's IMDb. There is at Michelle O'Han on Instagram. I'm on Facebook that old thing um and uh, i have a website so um it's all there usually um and yeah instagram is probably the quickest it's my name my, my name and my last name cool um, yeah. michelle thank you so much for this free time i personally learned a lot and i'm sure everyone that watches this will be not only better documentary filmmakers but inspired to keep pushing forward thank you that was fun thank you so much that's the end of our conversation with Michelle. If you enjoyed it or if you learned something, uh, please subscribe to our channel. And if you have any follow-up questions for Michelle or for myself, um, just let us know in the comments. If you enjoyed this, I think you will also really enjoy this conversation. Thank you for watching.